Good morning and welcome to the 11th edition of Tata Literature Live, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Project. This session is sponsored by Blank Slate Knowledge Foundation. Well, who doesn't love history? I do, but I know some who don't because of the number of facts and dates that one has to memorize in order to vomit out in one's exams. But author Minnie Menon has saved the day with her lovely book, The Swan Car of Nabha and Other Unusual Stories from History. It has the oddest and quirkiest stories from our very own history. Minnie Menon is an award-winning journalist, currently the co-founder and editor at Live History India, which is a result of her fascination for India and her history. So without further ado, over to Minnie Menon. Thanks, Ratna. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And it's so wonderful to be here at the little festival talking about what I love the most, which is history. Uh, well, thank you for joining us on this session. And I must introduce the book and hold it up for you, because this is really a, a fun book that talks about how history can really open up the mind. Like Ratna said, many of us believe that history is just a list of numbers, of empires, of kings, of wars, of battles, and a lot of uh, dates that you have to remember. But the fact is that the deeper you go into history, the more you realize that it's what shapes us, isn't it? It's also something which is so full of the amazing, amazing twists and turns. And in a sense, it really captures the essence of uh, the legacy that we carry as Indians. Uh, it's an amazing uh, um, legacy that all of you must know of. And in this book, we've tried to really make history come alive uh, through quirky histories. Now, why quirky histories? Because as you go deeper into history, you realize that fact is really crazier than fiction. You can't imagine how amazing the story of India is. We often think of the story of man, history, from the time of the Paleolithic man or the first man who walked the earth, etc. But if you actually go back, the story of India starts many, many, many um, centuries, you no know, millennia ago, a couple of uh, maybe 120 million years ago, when India, the subcontinent as you know it, moved across the oceans to join uh, the Asian landmass. So we start our story in quirky history from this there and then take you through the twists and turns which will really blow your mind. We have all sorts of stories of eccentric Maharajas, hidden treasures. We have stories of how games that we take for granted like chess moved out of India. We have the stories of amazing uh, compilations of stories like the Panchatantra and how it really swept through the world long before anybody heard of fairy tales and Hans Christian Andersen, for instance. And we also have uh, the stories of some very, very interesting men who actually shaped the world we live in, and we know very little about it. So uh, this uh, morning, we are going to be talking about three uh, stories, and uh, we have a very interesting session planned out for you with Aditi and Sahir, who are going to be reading out these stories. Uh, but I I must tell you that these are three of my favorite stories. And by the way, I'm not the only author of this book because we have a whole team of researchers at Live History India who have worked and put this together. I'm only the editor, but these three stories are by far my favorite because they have three things which I love. The first, of course, is dogs. Uh, the second is ice cream. And the third is really uh, something that we can't really live without. But I'm not going to tell you what that is. I'll let uh, Aditi and Sahir do that for you. Uh, and uh, let's go on, on this very, very quirky journey to understand our history and ourselves. Ratna. Yes, we're so lucky that we're good to get to hear your favorite stories from the book. Uh, thanks to our very two lovely performers, uh, Aditi Putran and Sahir Mehta. It's storytelling time. Yes. Over to you, Aditi and Sahir. Okay. Hi. We're just getting ready for a very exciting dog wedding. Jackie has been invited to his friend Coco and Lisha's wedding. Um, did you know the first ever dog wedding happened in 1922? That was in the town of Junagadh. The famous wedding in Junagadh 
it will not surprise you that for the Nawab of Junagadh, dogs were more important than all the wealth in the world. The Nawab, Muhammad Mahabad Khan III, owned over 3,000 dogs. And each of his favorite dogs had an air-conditioned kennel, an attendant, and even a telephone, for God knows what. Now, there was even a special hospital and an English vet employed to treat them. The Nawab spent over 11% of his kingdom's revenue on the upkeep of his dogs. And all of his dogs, surprisingly, ate better than most of his impoverished subjects. Now, coming back to the dog wedding. In the year 1922, the Nawab came upon an idea to celebrate a dog wedding. His favorite golden retriever, Roshanara, was to be married to Bobby, his prime minister's pet. Now, invitations were sent all over India, and an invitation also included one to the British Viceroy. But the British Viceroy thought, oh, it is too frivolous to attend the dog wedding, and I will not attend it. So what happened is the Nawab decided that he will not be deterred. He will celebrate his dog wedding with great fanfare. And he decided to declare the day of the wedding as a state holiday in the town of Junagadh. Now, on the day of the wedding, Roshanara was dressed in brocade and pearls and brought to the Darbar Hall on a palanquin. Bobby's Bharat was greeted at a train station by a military band and a procession of 250 dogs with Bobby on an elephant. The wedding was followed by fireworks, a grand banquet, and over 700 guests. This was not the Nawab's only eccentricity, though. Even on days when there wasn't a dog wedding, he would dress his favorite dogs in brocade and pearls, take them on a rickshaw around Mall Road in Shimla. At that time, Shimla happened to be the summer capital of India. And it was where most of the British Maharajas and Indian Maharajas and officials all over India congregated. Now, as India marched to its freedom in 1947, the Nawab was presented with a choice. Should he join India or should he join Pakistan? He decided that he will pack all of his Jews, his 200 favorite dogs, and he flew to Karachi. But what is even funnier is that while he took 200 of his favorite dogs, he forgot his queen behind, Begum Munawar Jahan. The, the poor queen had to make her way all the way to Karachi on her own. Now, the Nawab's kingdom might have been lost, but his obsession did not stop. Even in Karachi, every week the Nawab would hold a march past of his dogs dressed in brocade and jewels. This continued until the money ran out. Now the palace of Junagadh truly went to the dogs. Today, with pet cafes springing up on every corner, we have groomers, we have vegan dog food, we have luxury dog kennels, we have everything that pampers the pooch lifestyle. I'm telling you, Jackie himself likes his weekly pedicure. But did you know that the relationship of us with dogs dates back to the Vedic ages? In the Mahabharata, there is a very famous story that years after the battle of the Kurukshetra, when the Pandavas and their wife Draupadi decided to leave the earth and enter heaven, they were accompanied by none other than a stray dog. From hunting together in the wilderness thousands of years ago to being a part of family vacations today, the role that dogs play in our lives has come a very long way. Something to think about, no? Why you take your favorite dog for a walk? Now, I'm getting raped for the wedding, and I have to feed Jackie before we leave. He only likes spaghetti and white sauce with a dash of cilantro and garlic bread toasted on the side. So I'll see you really soon. Bye. Jackie, wait for me. Wise men say ice cream will get you sick, but I can't stop. Eating too much of the you sorry yeah I didn't know where it started <clears throat> okay yeah ready okay let's go the scoop on ice cream now you might find it hard to believe but in the 19th century one of the most coveted imports from the United States was ice. You may also wonder why India, home to the snow-capped Himalayas, was importing ice all the way from the United States in the first place. The journey of ice and ice cream to India is riveting. Now, for a country like India, known for its hot summers, it comes as no surprise that there was always a demand for ice 
and ice water. In fact, one of the oldest references to ice being used in the country is in the 7th century when King Harshwardhana of Kanoj used to use it to cool his buttermilk. But it was only in 1586, after the conquest of Kashmir, that large quantities of ice actually began to be imported. It used to come on horses and elephants. Another source was the Chudar Peak near Simur in Himachal Pradesh, which was said to be covered with snow throughout the year. To cater to the heavy demand for ice, ice pans were established in both Delhi and Agra. The ice was made and stored in December and January, and then the supply used to last all the way till August. Then the arrival of a large number of Europeans in the 18th and 19th centuries led to an even greater demand for ice. It was sourced from the Himalayan rivers, but you know, getting the ice down to the plains, it was an expensive, labor-intensive process. Ice slabs had to be cut using saws and axes and then transported across these huge distances. It was only the very rich who could afford to buy and then serve ice. Enter enterprising American in faraway Boston, Frederick Tudor, who revolutionized the ice trade in India. Now, Tudor had experimented for years with different techniques to preserve ice. And then he finally found it. He realized that uh, packing ice in sawdust, that was the key to preventing it from melting. Now, sawdust was almost free because it was a byproduct of the lumber trade. So soon he established his Tudor Ice Company and he began exporting slabs of ice packed in sawdust to the West Indies and Brazil. And then in 1833, a fellow Boston merchant proposed and he said, hey, Tudor, you know that ice you got going for you? Why don't you send some to India? And Tudor was like, wow, yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, it's only some 16,000 nautical miles away. But he did it. And on 6 September, 1833, after a journey of nearly four months, a ship named Tuscany arrived in Calcutta, carrying 180 tons of cargo of ice. <laughs> I mean, the arrival of this ice caused a real sensation among the residents. Jade Stockler even wrote about it in his newspaper, The Englishman. <laughs> he wrote of being woken up by his orderly, who was hysterical and said, Sab, Sab, they've brought slabs of snow to the Calcutta docks. The Tudor Ice Company had arrived and they built ice houses in Bombay, Madras, and of course, Calcutta to store their ice. And then they faced a peculiar problem. Now, most locals in India, as well as the West Indies and Brazil, had no idea what to do with all the ice. Given this predicament, Tudor hit upon an innovative idea. Can you guess what it is? He came up with ice cream. He began aggressively promoting this new dish called the ice cream, and all of this just to create a market for his ice. Now, the earliest recorded reference to ice cream in India comes from Bombay in 1834 when noted Parsi merchant Sir Jamshed Chi Gigi Boy served it at a housewarming party. And it was such a hit with him and his guests, and they had so much of it, so much of it, that the next day they all fell ill. So, next time someone says, Don't have too much ice cream, your mom tells you that. Believe her, she knows Gigi Boy's story. She knows it'll get you sick. Now, ice became a kind of status symbol among the Indian elite. And there was such a demand for it that at certain times, you had to get a doctor's certificate to go and buy ice. But finally, in 1855, new techniques of manufacturing ice emerged. And it was no longer necessary to import it all the way from Boston. Ice soon became available in cities all across the country. And the Tudor Ice Company sold their ice houses. Today, the Calcutta Ice House is a small causes court. The Madras Ice House is the Vivek under Elam Exhibition Center. And the Bombay Ice House is the prestigious K.R. Kama Oriental Institute. Incredibly, the company which started it all, the Tudor Ice Company, they're still in operation in Boston. And they still sell ice. Tahir, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Uh, surgery. What surgery? Uh, uh, shampoo surgery. The shampoo needed it. Uh, I'm a shampoo surgeon. What's a shampoo surgeon? You know, like, like, the, like the story we read. Like, like Dean Sheikh Mohammed. I'm a shampoo surgeon. So it's a great job. That's not what a shampoo surgeon is. That's no, 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 no. Exactly you read the story wrong. Oh, yeah? 
you, yeah. you want to bet on it? Yeah, I want to bet on it. Let's okay. do the story fine, again. Fine. We bet on it. I mean, it's my favorite story. Of course, I know what it means. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Yeah. The man That's behind cool. the shampoo. Listen up, kids. See who's right. Right. Sheikh Dean Muhammad was quite a character. He was a soldier, an entrepreneur, and a writer. He was quite a celebrity. He was also one of the earliest Indians to head to Europe. Now, Muhammad was born in 1759 in Patna, which was then under the Nawab of Bengal. His father was a member of the Nai or Baba community, and he was employed by the British East India Company, which had recently taken control after the Battle of Plassey in 1757. Unfortunately, when Muhammad was only 10 years old, his father died, leaving behind a large family. Muhammad's elder brother was given their father's position. and mohammed was left on his own to make a living at just the age of 10 he joined the east india company as part of the bengal army's third regiment his marches with the east india company took him as far west as delhi and as far east as dhaka dhaka is currently in um bangladesh I, oh yeah i i knew that It all. He also sailed to Madras, which happens to be in South India, and is currently called um, Chennai. Uh, right. I was just testing you, Sahil. Good. Huh. Well done. Well done. Mm-hmm. Anyway, at the age of twenty-five, Muhammad decided to leave for Ireland. Now he decided that over there he will study to advance his education, and so he did. He studied. English and also literature, and fell in love with an Irish girl, Jane Daly. Since their relationship was against the norm in those race-conscious times, Muhammad decided to elope with his wife, and they got married in another town. In 1793, Muhammad took out a series of advertisements in newspapers seeking subscribers for his book, The Travels of Dean Muhammad. Now, in those days, before commercial publishing came into vogue. Book subscription meant that you got early access to limited edition books, which were not offered for sale in bookshops. Almost three twenty people subscribed to the book, which was published as a series of letters. It was an autobiographical autobiographical account of his life's adventures, as well as the contemporary situation in India. Now, by around eighteen or seven, Muhammad was finally financially comfortable. So he, along with his Anglo-Irish Indian family, decided to leave Ireland for England. Here in England, he worked as a medical practitioner, but Muhammad wasn't the kind of person who would settle for a boring, steady life. Not satisfied with his career as a medical practitioner, he opened London's first Indian restaurant, the Hindustani Coffee House, in the year 1810. The newspaper announcing the restaurant's advertisement read, "Yeah, uh, oh no, I, okay, oh, sorry, it's here." Hindustani Coffee House number 34 George Street Portman Square Muhammad East Indian informs the nobility and gentle he has fitted up the above house neatly and elegantly for the entertainment of gentlemen where they may enjoy the hookah with real chillum tobacco and indian dishes in the highest perfection and allowed by the greatest epicure to be unequal to any curries ever made in england <gasps> interestingly the restaurant even offered home delivery another advertisement read Such ladies and gentlemen as may be desirous of having Indian dinners dressed and sent to their own houses will be punctually attended to by giving previous notice. But this venture was not a success. Unfortunately, the culture of eating out at the time did not exist. So Muhammad had to shut down his restaurant, and within just two years, he declared bankruptcy. However, there is something very interesting to note about this. In the year 2018, specifically in the month of June. Muhammad Dean's restaurant's handwritten menus was auctioned for eight thousand five hundred pounds. So I have I have all of these menus. Uh, uh-huh. You know, Brownie Point, uh, Chinatown. How much do you think I would get for these menus? I mean, with like Chinatown, I'm probably ten thousand, ten thousand pounds. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? You just need to send them in the year three thousand. Never mind. Don't want to wait. That, that, that's fine. Patience is a virtue. Uh, his failure didn't stop him. Searching for yet another way to market his Indian learnings to the British public, Muhammad moved with his family to the seaside town of Brighton. Here, in 1821, he opened another business called Muhammad's Baths. 
Muhammad offered visitors the Indian medicated vapor bath with aromatic Indian oils. Now this was a turning point in his story. The idea worked like a charm and soon Mohammed Bean's aromatic oils and massages were being enjoyed by none other than the royal family. Finally, he was given the royal stamp of recognition, which is a badge of honor given to those who offer goods or services to the royal family. He was awarded warrants of appointment as shampooing surgeon to the royalty. Yes, yes. I was like Sahib. I was like. You were right. Yeah. You were right. That's what a shampooing right. surgeon is. <laughs> Soon, hospitals oh. began referring patients to Mohammed. His reviews made him a celebrity and earned him the moniker Dr. Brighton. It is during this time that the word shampoo entered the common English lexicon. Did you know that the word shampoo originates from the Hindi word champi or champu, which actually means head massage? And did you know that the word typhoon comes from the Urdu Hindu uh, Hindi word tufan, and also bandana? It comes from bandna. Sahir, focus on the story. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Mohammed helped promote shampoo, and he even published a book, shampooing or benefits resulting from the use of the Indian medicated vapor bath, which became a bestseller and was reprinted three times. Muhammad would go on to have his portrait hung in the Brighton Museum. He was celebrated as the man who brought together Indian and British cultures way back in the early 1800s. He also published several treatises on the ailments his treatments could, could, could cure, which included all manner of complaints from asthma to paralysis to even nervous disorders. He set himself apart from the competition by emphasizing the uniqueness of his Indian method. After an eventful life, Sheikh D. Muhammad died in Brighton at the ripe old age of 92. He would soon be forgotten in history until his story was rediscovered in the 1980s. Today, Dean Muhammad is considered a pioneer in the British Asian community. However, in India, I think his story is still relatively unknown. <sighs> wow, that is quite a story. Aditi, Aditi, I've got yes. it. This, this, this book, it's incredible. It's, yeah. it's inspired me. I Absolutely. am going to invent something. Like what? Like, you know, like, it, it's, uh, like a shampoo, obviously, uh, okay. made out of ice cream for dogs. What? I'm, I'm, no, yes, I'm, 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 I'm going to make a shampoo ice cream for dogs. A shampoo ice cream? No, Can no. I'll try it on Jackie. I'll try it on Jackie. No, you cannot. I'll come right over. No. I'll come right over. No. Tell him he's going to have the best day of his life. I'll come see you. See you. See you. Sorry, no. What? Jackie! Well, it's shampoo ice cream for dogs. My dog is going to love that because it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to go right into her stomach. Well, I hope you enjoyed those, that, uh, those, those stories. Uh, they're read out so beautifully beautifully by Aditi and Sahej. Uh, isn't it sad uh, when I was listening to that uh, story, the last one on Deen Muhammad, isn't it sad that we don't know more about Deen Muhammad? That you talk to anybody about Deen Muhammad and they'll say, who's that? And that's the whole idea of Live History India, really, to bring out these stories from our past uh, so that we understand the significance of uh, people like Deen Muhammad, who really, in 92 years of his life, you know, straddled so many new areas, uh, did so many new things, and left such a telling mark behind the shampoo that we all use uh, uh, every week. Uh, so really, this, this whole idea of quirky histories is to let you have fun with history, but also understand the layers that make history. The idea of how human societies evolve, for instance. The fact that ice, till about 1833 or the 19th century, came See, from 16,000 miles away from the U.S. into India. That just about 100 years ago, a king in Junagar actually had a state wedding for his dog. Who would imagine that in a country as poor as ours that a king would really splurge on a dog and have such a huge party for it? Well, these are interesting facts which hopefully also make you think a little deeper and try and understand uh, where we came from to better make sense of where we are going. So that's the whole idea of history. And this book is full of anecdotes like this, stories like this. And I hope you do get to read it and enjoy it. Over to you.
state wedding for his dog. That's my kind of leader. That's amazing. Thank you, many men and Aditi Putran and Sai Mehta for that marvelous bit of storytelling from the book, which I'm definitely going to get for myself, The Swan Car of Nabha and Other Unusual Stories from History, which is available on tataclick.com as well as uh, uh, there's a link on our website, tatalitlive.com. Coming up, there's more to the little festival today. Uh, there's a session called Comic Relief, illustrating characters in stories where you'll get to find out how to bring your story alive. Not just that, there's also a workshop at 12.15 p.m., just shortly from now, Magical Beasts and Where to Find Them, a workshop on creating mythical characters. And of course, the fantastic musical production of Snow Queen at 2.45 p.m. You cannot miss that one. A big thank you to the session sponsors, Blank Slate Knowledge Foundation. All this and more exciting stuff at Data Literature Live. With that, I'll be signing off. See you soon at the next session.